Okay, so our, our next speaker is Tom Council, who until recently was a deputy director at the Department of Energy and Climate Change and one of the chief architects of the 2050 calculator, um, working with David. Um, and uh, as many of you here in Cambridge will be familiar with, um, he was also uh, the de developer with David of Talks.cam, uh, which we all use <laughs> all the time. So, Tom Council. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Good, okay. Um, I thought we would start with uh, a little quiz, um, or a vote perhaps. Um, could 10 billion people live like me, and I'm a pretty much a typical UK citizen, uh, and I mean live like me in terms of travel like I do, eat like I do, have a nice warm house like I do, um, uh, uh, have all the stuff that I and my kids need um, to have a, a happy lifestyle, um, and yet we are still avoid the um, most serious effects of climate change. So should we have a quick vote? Who says that, yes, if only we built enough power stations, if only we planted enough fields full of bio crops, if only we insulated our homes effectively enough. <laughs> Could we do it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, who thinks that yes, if only we built enough nuclear power stations or wind turbines or planted enough fields full of bio crops, insulated our homes, had efficient cars, we could actually have 10 billion people, everybody on this planet, living the lifestyle that I live. Who thinks that's possible? And uh, who thinks it's not possible that if we are serious about avoiding the worst effects of climate change, we need some change in the way we live? So traveling less, eating less, doing less. Okay. And who has uh, no idea or is unwilling to <laughs> answer the question? Okay, I was in that camp uh, a few years ago. Um, but before we talk uh, more about that, and just so people can see the votes who can't see, broadly we had um, probably half the people saying, no, we can't, perhaps 25% of the people saying, yes, we could, and maybe 10 or 15% saying, I have no idea. But before that, I'd like to uh, have a short digression uh, into what happens um, <laughs> when a book meets a government department. Um, because it really did meet a, a government department in quite a big way. Uh, because, uh, as you all know, this is the book that Dave McKay uh, wrote um, over the period, what, I don't know when you started, 2005, 6, 7, 8, it was published somewhere around then? 2008. And 2008 was also the year that in the UK we passed our Climate Change Act, which legally obliged the government to come up with a plan for an energy system that would actually be, um, have 80% lower uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So it was actually a requirement to implement um, effectively a numerate plan as laid out in David Mackay's book, um, which had effectively two, uh, two consequences. Uh, one is that uh, they recruited David to become the chief science advisor, and the second is they started to try and work out the answer to that question, what would a sustainable energy plan for the UK look like? Um, and uh, uh, if you know the book and have read the book, it's basically about uh, trying to suggest that you can figure it out. If you really wanted to, you can sit down and read the book, follow the maths, and actually work out for yourself what a sustainable energy plan might look like in broad, rough terms, and you can figure out the answer for yourselves. Um, but when that meets uh, government, the people that actually um, are meant to figure it out uh, in government, certainly at this stage, is uh, Gordon Brown's uh, cabinet. It's a sort of collective government responsibility that they're meant to come up with this plan legally for parliament. Uh, and of course, uh, they don't have the time to do that. So uh, what they do is they delegate it to a committee of perm sex, who in turn delegate it to a committee of senior government officials, who in turn delegate it to a committee of junior government officials, who in turn think, wow, I've got to get this answer in six months. One person can't do it. We best have a team. So they put together a team of 10 people who then have to spend a lot of time doing management, a lot of time feeding committees uh, with paperwork and minutes and how things work, responding to those views. And occasionally, just very occasionally, they get to do some figuring out. Uh, the second thing when they formed up that team 
is this problem of, uh, the other thing point to the book is simplification is key to understanding. So David's always about trying to simplify things down, do things simply to try and get a broad order of magnitude. Um, that, uh, I think, was very, very alien to how the government did stuff. It just wasn't the way that we tackled stuff. Either we didn't figure it out, or we got really complicated uh, kind of technical experts to tell us what the possible range was. So what we would often end up with is uh, here we have a range of scenarios, say, for transport and future. And in particular, I might point to... Uh, uh, does this mouse work? Can I get the mouse on the thing? Okay, can't the point to the kilometers traveled per person uh, and the uh, fact that uh, when we try to go to the Department for Transport and ask them about what the range of possible futures they thought for the way people might travel in 40 years' time, they come up with a very precise uh, 14,076 kilometers per person per year, um, very narrow range of what the future might be. And when asked why those numbers, they couldn't tell you why. It was because a big, complicated piece of analysis told you that that was the answer. Even though it, it surely must be untrue that that range there covers all the possible futures for how far you could travel uh, in the UK in 40 years' time. The second challenge we had in effectively implementing the book um, was the other point of David's book was that to focus on the big things that make a big difference. So uh, every little helps a little bit, being a little line from the book, and every big uh, thing is what you actually want. Whereas in government, we're pretty much forced to spend a lot of time talking equally about all the small things and putting them on an equal footing to all the big things at the time, just the way that the nature of the stakeholders and the politics work. So we'd spend a lot of time worrying about um, wave and geothermal and small-scale wind, when in fact none of those things are actually big things that warrant an equal footing of time. A third problem, just as a digression, uh, is that uh, obviously David uh, knows how to use computers uh, and suggests that using computers is often a good idea. Uh, in government, uh, on our desktops, the only uh, piece of analysis tool that we are allowed or permitted to install um, is Excel. And that, in some ways, uh, is a horrific constraint, but in other ways, it did help in this situation. It did force us to keep it simple, and as a, like a counterpoint to why we couldn't rely on complicated analysis, it did allow us to have that pressure back to do simple analysis. Um, the other problem, generally, um, with working in government is that uh, whilst David's always encouraging numbers, not adjectives, to trying to present information clearly, use numbers to get a sense of scale, do things correctly in terms of their, don't use sort of woolly words that don't sort of mean anything. Um, you've got to have the politics of saying, when is the right time to actually use the numbers, or when do you use woolly words? Um, and I'd like to sort of point to, because it's quite hard to find, the actual publication, the first government sort of attempt uh, at David Mackay's book and where it was published. Um, it was rather surprisingly published um, as part of the budget, 2010, which is not exactly the obvious point. It wasn't published in the budget, 2010. It was published uh, there, in the supplementary documents to the budget, 2010. And here is a supplementary document, and it wasn't even the supplementary document. It was published as an annex to the supplementary document of the budget. And it wasn't even published very well in that. If you read through it, it's about five pages of broadly number-free adjectives. And that was the uh, culmination of a team of 10 peoples, three layers of committees, hard work attempting to implement uh, David's book uh, over a, mm, uh, ended up about a year period. Pretty bad, eh? But fortunately, because of David's genius idea, the fact that numbers are added means charts as well, he also proposed that when we were doing this work, we should put together an interactive tool, basically to take his book and make it interactive, so you could move kind of toggles around, try out different scenarios, see them move up and down on your desktop. And because of that genius idea, whereas most reports get ignored and hidden, 
This kept going in the department. People started using it around the department. We had little workshops around the department just to play with the tools and start exploring the ideas. And the whole idea kind of gently kept alive when the team had been completely disbanded until a change of government. Then with a change of government, you have a change of ambition and a change of possibilities. And the whole work got published properly and numerately and all together uh, out there as the DEX 2050 plan. If you haven't played with it, I really recommend it. It's sort of like the government's attempt to replicate the book. And it did some good things. It really, uh, it really helped uh, uh, have different groups actually have a fact-based discussion together. So you have groups like you know, Shells and Friends of the Earth who would disagree violently about what the right answer would be, what the right way to go would be, but would agree about the facts and using the tool as a way of doing that. And we always started, because we followed David's kind of mantra of openness and transparency, it started being tried out by other countries around the world. First, the uh, Belgian region of Flan uh, Flanders? No, no what it's called. Anyway, yes. That, that one, was it? Wallonia, that's right. That's what I was looking for. Um, and then gradually around the world, so that China used the tool, India used the tool, they replicated and took our approach, building on David's work, to build up their own kind of ways of exploring different energy plans um, that add up, even though they have really different views about what the right kind of plan is, and really different views about what the right trade-offs are um, to make ethically. However, there was a, a flaw uh, in all this work and in all the other countries' work, and that was uh, one of the things that often we would do is we would rely on other countries to do stuff on our behalf. So in the UK, we obviously rely on other countries to manufacture a lot of our goods. So any plan that adds up to the UK depends on other countries. We would often, in all these countries, be seeing relying on large imports of bioenergy from other countries. So other countries growing crops and shipping it to you. And the question is, really? Can we really do that? Uh, and so uh, that was one of the motivations for figuring out why we have to tackle it at sort of a global level and why we came back uh, to this question to see if we could have a go at implementing David's book, uh, but for the world all at once. And when I say we, uh, I really mean um, these guys, uh, uh, with Sophie Hartfield up the top there, who was in charge of uh, broadly forming the three layers of management committee, uh, navigating all the paperwork through there, spending a year of bureaucracy to raise uh, the money, and assembling everything together. And every now and again, her and Tom Bain would do some analysis. And this is what they made. Okay, so on your screen here, you can see this is the world's supply of energy up there with the large uh, blue bit. There, I can use the mouse on this one, can I? Yep. Um, saying that basically it's fossil fuels, our world energy uh, supply at the moment. Here is our demand for energy with the three different colors broadly being the three big blocks, being manufacturing, transport, and buildings. Is that better? Yep. Okay. This is the consequences of that in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, so the gigatons of carbon we spit out. And this is roughly the consequences in terms of what it might mean for climate change as measured by the metric of temperature uh, rise with a range on there. And down here, we have a whole bunch of choices all the way down there of all the different things that might influence those uh, outcomes up there. So for instance, uh, how far we travel might be one influence on it, where we've got two extremes, one extreme, another extreme, and you can see how that impacts the demand for energy, the supply for energy, the greenhouse gas emissions, and then the temperature rise. Over here, we have perhaps a similar one for wind. Uh, so how many wind turbines we build, extremes, levels in between. Okay? And so broadly, the numbers always go um, uh, from one extreme to the other with going that direction across the screen, this direction for other people in the room, uh, meaning uh, you're hopefully that direction will increase the uh, effort towards tackling climate change. Um, and so uh, what we've got up here is just a, a, a fairly uh, random starting point. In fact, let me make sure that it is not entirely random. This is what the International Energy Agency uh, say is about to, is the kind of likely future as implemented in this calculator. Um, so the, we're seeing here the demand for energy going up a lot, it basically still relying on fossil fuels um, and therefore triggering uh, increasing year on year greenhouse gas emissions and somewhere up between a two degree and a six degree 
temperature rise. So there are some interesting features about this. Uh, the first is that that doesn't even include actually everybody having a lifestyle like I do. It just has a lifestyle that's a little bit worse. But we can probably do better than that. So uh, what should we actually do? What should we build in terms of power stations? What should we grow in terms of crops? Or what should we do in terms of efficiency of transport to try and uh, create a better future than the one we have here? Any suggestions? Cut out meat. Anything else? We can have more nuclear. Anything else? Travel a bit less. Anything else? More contraption. Smaller population. Anything else? Hmm? Solar and all the deserts. Okay, cool. So we've got there uh, two, two uh, changes that are about doing something on the technology side, about actually contributing to say, you can live how you're currently expecting to live, um, but do something else. And three changes, which are about uh, do something about the lifestyles. Uh, just for the sake of, uh, of uh, exploring, we're going to start on the technology side to explore whether the question that I posed before is correct, but then we can explore the lifestyle stuff as well. So, suggestion on nuclear power. Each one of these, if you click on it, has a little view on the future possibilities of nuclear power and how much we have today, uh, roughly 415 gigawatts of nuclear power. It could, at one extreme, go all the way up to uh, you know, 1,000, was that 800 gigawatts? Another stream go down to zero and levels in between. Any suggestions on what would be an appropriate level? Should we go all out? Are you all, is everyone here pro-nuclear out of address? Anyone here anti-nuclear? Oh, there are some. Yeah, okay. I don't know why that. All right. So if we go all out for nuclear power, you can see we make a reasonable dent in the global emissions. And you start to see that little red chunk there is the energy supply from going all out um, from nuclear. But I mean, let's be clear, though, this is all out as viewed by experts on their build rates. It's not necessarily all that could possibly be. But anyway, um, OK, what was the second one? Solar in deserts. OK. The world of solar. So we broadly, to a rounding error, have zero solar <laughs> in the world today. Uh, and some people are very, very uh, enthusiastic about uh, uh, solar, the potential uh, amount of solar in terms of power capacity we do have. And interestingly, the most uh, enthusiastic group uh, about solar were Shell. Um, they were the people that would, were busy trying to anchor that top line, um, being it there. Are people completely enthusiastic about solar? Is it going to be the perfect solution? Yeah? Anybody think solar is not a great thing? Nah, everyone thinks. So for the world, it probably is pretty helpful. OK. <coughs> so let me see that. We made the change. Pretty good, but we haven't actually tackle climate change yet, and then that box didn't move that far. So pausing for a second on the lifestyle suggestions, which we will come back to, so the things where you change either population or eating meat uh, or that sort of thing, traveling a bit less. Let's, anything else that we can do to actually see whether we can make it and have a great lifestyle and tackle climate change? Insulate our buildings? All right. And. Uh, this isn't a particularly informative graph, but you know, uh, we, uh, we could measure the insulation in buildings in terms of the heat loss that you might get and how, much, how better are we doing at reducing the heat loss per degree of difference. Um, this obviously only matters for hot countries. For cool countries, you need to do something, uh, sorry, for cold countries. For hot countries, you need something else about reducing solar gains. But we could basically uh, do things ranging from uh, down here uh, about getting down to uh, a quarter of the typical heat loss uh, that you actually get from a home as one extreme. We'd also expect some improvement to happen sort of automatically as people get newer homes and better homes over the future. Um, it does have a side effect. It does mean changing the way the homes look and feel quite substantially, smaller inside or fatter walls outside or that sort of thing. Um, should we go for it? Can you pull up for it? Change all the homes? Yeah, 
Okay, a little bit. So the model basically assumes, uh, as you see here, this pathway happens. So that line is followed. So you can see they are simple lines that probably in no way reflect how the future will pan out. But hopefully you might, you know, average around that. OK, what else are we going to do? TTS. TTS. <coughs> OK, uh, do you mean on, uh, <laughs> I can ask you this question. The, uh, do you mean on power stations or on manufacturing? <laughs> on everything. So this is the idea where you let them burn coal or gas, you take the stuff that comes out, the, out to the end of the chimney, uh, or a little bit earlier, and you bury that uh, somewhere underground. Um, okay. So these are the range, that, that's the industry one. Uh, and that's the manufacturing one. Where broadly, again, to a rounding error, we have none today, um, and we could get up to the levels of having equivalent to every power station in the world today um, be there. So let's go for it. So, okay, there we go. Do you see the change? Made a change, but we haven't made it. Anything else we could do? Energy storage. Um, probably something we'd have to do as part of dealing with um, solar. So you can put it in here and out of here, but this is uh, sadly not really the model to tackle whether that's essential or it makes a big difference. Um, you need energy storage uh, if you want to limit the amount of capacity you have, particularly of renewables. Electrified El electrified transport, okay. So uh, what proportion of electric vehicles do we think we could get? Uh, we could go all the way up there to maybe 50%, some people think, to be electrified. Can you do that? Seems pretty easy. Yes. How are we doing? Get in there. What else should we do? Um, yep, so it is being pushed out as we do stuff. So the way the model works is it assumes that uh, you uh, 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 use fossil fuels as your last resort after having used whatever else you've chosen here, nuclear power stations, that sort of thing. We can do if we are giving up on this world and saying that the answer is definitively no. We'll max out renewables first. Yeah, you'd like to max out renewables? Let us go for renewables of all their forms in terms of electricity. Anything else we can do? Or are we there? No fusion. <laughs> Would you like to? Uh, we, we did, in the UK, get lobbied a few times on the lack of inclusion of fusion. Uh, we sort of had a lack of data, anyway. <laughs> Anything else? Recycling. Recycling, yep. So that will be um, down here. We've lumped a few things together in here, but generally the idea that um, instead of using primary materials like you know, raw steel, raw aluminium, we do our best to minimize the amount we need for any given kind of design of product we have. And then what we don't minimize, we try and recycle and do a lot. So that made a fairly chunky difference. We are getting there. We went all out and were the world's, the universe's most enthusiastic recyclers. Anything else? Yeah, uh, so uh, we did somewhere. Where, where did we put it? <laughs> there we go, uh, because we thought of it. So uh, yeah, we didn't actually disperse particles, but we did a bunch of other ones uh, here, uh, such as um, uh, ocean fertilization, <laughs> enhanced weathering, other forms of enhanced weathering. Biochar. Um, the reason they're hidden back here is um, nobody trusts 
um, these numbers. I mean, these are all ranges that are here, but these are uh, everyone complained a lot about the speculative nature. So yeah, you could do some last resort stuff. Anything else? How are we feeling? Optimistic about the future? All the, uh, the half of you that said, uh, 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 no, there, there was a quarter of you that said, yes, we could do it. So carbon taxation. What, so this model, and it's interesting because it often has that, um, policies are really hard to do. So um, if you want to implement a carbon taxation law, it takes a lot of gov effort by government um, to actually get a carbon taxation law, even more effort to get it agreed across Europe and across the world. Um, why are we doing it? What changes are we expecting to have as a result of it? And this is the tool for exploring what changes it is. Once we've agreed what changes it is that we want, we can then probably go ahead and design carbon taxation, cap and trade, uh, legislation about you know, standards, all those good things. But this is just a fundamental point, is even we, we tilting at the right thing. Anything else? <coughs> Building size. Building size. Um, lifestyle thing. But maybe we will stop there and move on to lifestyle. Since people... Have... Mm. Yeah, thank you. Should we go for land use? So crop yields. What if we really went for crop yields? What if we really went for intensifying the way our livestock are? What if we really went for multi-cropping and the like. And so those are those right-hand ones, and given that we have time to do much more, but it's one of those areas where huh, we've spent a lot of time as a department uh, worrying an awful lot about these guys, and we have spent almost no time as a department worrying about those guys. And at a global level, those guys, if we want to have an amazing lifestyle. Oh, the map, okay. So we've all spent almost uh, loads of time speaking about these guys and almost no time thinking about these guys. And if we want to re retain a globally, have a really uh, sort of aspirational standard and style of living, like I have, um, then uh, we need to think about those things on the right and work out the trade-offs on them. And that's kind of a big surprise to uh, many people uh, in the department. People also, just so we can do it briefly, but do play with it, um, Lifestyle change, obviously you can do the counterpoint. You could go vegetarian. And that makes spectacular differences. And it's worth exploring and taking the time to play with the calculator and figure out uh, why that is, how that all plays through to make um, such a big difference. Uh, you can also play with other lifestyle choices down here. But let's be clear, if we're starting to say that we have to change our lifestyles, that is a very different negotiating strategy that the government needs to pursue in climate change negotiations than the one it currently does, which is about uh, pursuing the kind of idea that technology will fix it and that we can actually all work together and have a happy, develop, have our lifestyles and deal with technology. So I guess uh, I'd encourage you to play with this, uh, and I'd like to just finish by uh, saying a thank you to David. Um, because I think what he contributes to the department, both in terms of personally and in terms of how you see with the tools like this, is the sense is that you can actually figure it out. If you take the time, it's really worth figuring stuff out. And you can help other people to figure it out. And you can actually work through all the committees and structures and processes, and in the end, figure out different answers that really do change the way the government has to prioritize stuff. So thank you very much. Great. Um, we have time for some questions. Oh, yeah. if, uh, oh questions. Oh, <laughs> <coughs> yeah, we're in the back. Hold on. Ah. Thank you. Uh, Hello, Tom. Hello. Um, Slightly, a lot of effort for a slightly facetious question. <laughs> what are the chances, do you think, of the Department of Energy uh, changing into the Department of Food, Rural Affairs, and Climate Change? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, 
not zero, but I guess pretty close to zero for the next five years. Um, but it is, it is interesting because it's a reason that we talk. And in putting together the calculator here, part of the experience is actually you have to work with other government departments to talk about this stuff. And so there was actually much more talking about this stuff than there ever has been before. And things in government just take a long time to percolate through. So there's a chance, but not within five years. I wouldn't have thought. Another question? Um, so this question here, sorry. Hi. Um, I just want to ask, what is the value of making technology-based predictions 35 years in advance, given that technology in the past few years and you know major technology changes are marked by their disruptive unpredictable nature yeah so the uh, the uh, we can uh, always hope that there will be a massive technology disruption that will make all this irrelevant and if that happens i will be so happy that i wasted uh, 5 years of my life that will be you know that will be absolutely fine um, there is obviously uncertainty uh, in terms of how these technologies plan out. But that's the sort of point of tools like this. It's not to make a forecast about what will happen, but try and explore about what could happen and try and prioritize attention of where we should be looking and where we should be looking to make changes. So it's not telling us the answer, but telling us, ah, oh, over here, oh, it's not on the screen anymore, but you know, this food, crops stuff is really important. Prioritize some attention there. Hi, Tom. Hi, Mark. Um, this, there's a wiki aspect to this, isn't there? So there's a sort of open source um, approach which is quite inclusive and it also allows for uh, constant updating. I wonder if you could just address that a bit. And secondly, what's the future for the global calculator as you see it? How's it going to continue to be improved and continue to scale up so that it can be useful for both policymakers and you know, wider public opinion? Cool. Um, so. Uh, the first thing is just a, a little thing. This is all open source. So one of the legacies of David Mackay in the department is that we managed to sneak some open source, completely transparent work out the door. Um, and so from top to bottom, every single assumption, every single calculation, the whole lot is in an Excel spreadsheet, um, documented with this front end, is entirely open source and available to anyone to reuse and change and adapt how they see fit. And some people have done some nice translations, so you can also uh, view it in other languages. Uh, Maybe. Yeah, there you go. Um, we would really like people, if they disagree with some assumptions, and there are some assumptions in there to be disagreed with, to change it and to redo it and to publish it as they will. The UK, the government, the future. Uh, I'm not in the government anymore. Um, the, uh, there is still uh, two people whose job it is to promote and work on this at the moment. There is work going on to refresh and redo the UK work um, this year, towards the tail end of this year. Um, it will have to be seen how much survives ongoing cuts. Um, because the trouble with this stuff, really, is that it's very easy for uh, governments to cut. What about the global one? So this, the global one, yeah. So there are two people who are working on continuing it, promoting it, getting it going. There's still some budget that is improving it, making it better, talking about it. How much longer? I don't know. That's Jerry, isn't it? So what did happen to the commitment to the government to The UK one? Yeah. Yeah, we've uh, published a number of plans for how we uh, have, are going to actually hit the 2050 target. Um, in theory, the plans um, add up. There is a new plan that is going to be coming out probably in about three months' time that you should look out for that will lay out in some detail uh, the energy system for the UK possibilities between now and 2032, and in sketchy detail um, out to 2050. Um, and we now do that every five years. And uh, even if the results sometimes, as you see, look quite adjective v and not at all numbery, behind the scenes, there are more numbers. And often, if you do the right FOI request, you might get more numbers. Is there any way of integrating the David Spiegelhalter idea into this where you can start thinking, what can I do to make a micro difference mm -hmm. as an individual? Mm. 
Yeah, I, I think that's a really uh, good thing and a good suggestion. Like the most important difference I think you can make is to vote well and to make sure that you get the right people um, uh, in government uh, at the global level. <laughs> the next most important thing you can almost always do if you're in the UK is about your heating and the way you are. The next most important thing is going to be your travel and uh, possibly the last most important thing you can do uh, is to uh, change your lights or put a solar panel on your roof. But that would be a kind of quick hierarchy of how to do it. And there is another talk that can do that one, or David's talk, in fact, does that one. Okay, uh, let's take a last question. Just the, you know, the, the question you posed at the beginning, can we do it? Uh, you showed us a lot of different things, but I just wonder if you would give us your overview if, if you were uh, czar and uh, could, could get the world focused on one thing to change, what would you be focused on? So uh, I, uh, my initial view was, uh, I, uh, was to say that uh, I didn't really know the answer, but I was actually skeptical of the, whether it was possible. Um, and I'm naturally a techno-optimist by nature, and I, and I came in skeptical on this one. Um, I thought we would probably, in the end, have to do some lifestyle uh, change. The actual process made me less skeptical. Uh, I think we can, with technology, do it. I just think that we've got to focus really hard on this whole area of you know, the crops and the bioenergy and the food. And the kind of good news, I think, about that is it's kind of very unifying. Like, you know, uh, it brings together different interests about people who want to you know, do food research and eat well, but also across the world. Like, everybody thinks that food is helps with development and good crops help with development and good farming helps with development. And so we kind of tap into this common thing and actually make a bit of a difference there. And in doing that, unlock a bit here. And in doing that, maybe, just maybe, we'll get away without having to do lifestyle change. Because my suspicion is we won't do lifestyle change. We'll just have climate change. Um, thank you. So you, ans you answered that question in a sort of generic way uh, aimed at the UK population, I guess. But in this particular room of people with the skills in this room, uh, you mentioned about this big change that can be made on, on the crop side. What sort of skills are needed there or what sort of technology changes are needed there? And, and is there more of a role for people in this room? Uh, so uh, I'm probably not expert enough to say Broadly, the way it's done in this kind of calculator is to sort of explore the overall things about yields. So what if we got the trend rates of yields up sort of to their peak of what they've been doing in the past or what have been lower, that sort of thing. So uh, GM crop design would feel to me like an important industry of the future, um, even though it is unpopular in some quarters. Great. Uh, let's thank Tom again. And we now have a coffee break and we'll reconvene back here at 11.20.